I'm the Tarikh Tracker and welcome to the history of Al-Andalus, that is Islam in Spain and Portugal. I'll be traveling around two different countries, six different cities and ten different locations narrating to you the 900 year history of Islam and Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula. If that interests you, keep watching. AD and gathering across the Straits of Gibraltar in North Africa are 7,000 newly converted Berber Muslims ready to begin the Islamic presence on the Iberian Peninsula. However, Islam did not begin in North Africa and it did not begin with the Berbers. So how did we get to this point? Umayyads had completed the Islamic conquest of the whole of North Africa and in doing so they had integrated the native people of North Africa into the new religion of Islam that being the Berbers um, that deals with that side of the of the Straits on this side in the southern tip of Europe what we can say is in 711 this was not Spain and this was not Portugal this was um, a land which many different ethnicities had uh, migrated into such as Celtic people, Greek people, Phoenician people, Carthaginian people, Roman people, the Vandals and lastly the Visigoths. The Visigoths were initially a Germanic tribe from Northern Europe who now controlled the Iberian Peninsula and they were the ones who were in control in 711 when Musa ibn Nusayr, the governor of North Africa for the Umayyads, decided to send his freed slave and general Tariq ibn Ziyad, a Berber, to lead the army to take control of this small piece of land in the southern tip of Europe, thereby beginning the Islamic presence in Europe. The Muslims had arrived. Musa ibn Nusayr instructed Tariq ibn Ziyad to conduct raiding missions up and down the south coast of the Iberian Peninsula and when this happened the king of the Visigoths known as Don Rodrigo or King Roderick um, moved south with a huge army to meet this new threat. Having heard this Tariq asked Musa ibn Nusayr back home in Africa for some reinforcements so he received 5,000 new recruits in the term uh, in terms of Arab Muslim soldiers the scene was set for an epic showdown and it would happen at the Guadalet River not far from here and in this battle the Muslims were heavily outnumbered but nonetheless they attained a dramatic victory Don Rodrigo was killed his army was annihilated and there was not much uh, to come in terms of reinforcements Tariq ibn Ziyad sensed his opportunity to take the whole Iberian Peninsula. The route was on. Tariq ibn Ziyad 
continued his march forward and he would keep marching with his men until he reached right to the very center of the Iberian Peninsula to this city here which at that time in the year 711 was the capital of Visigothic Iberia and the Visigoths called the city Toledo the Muslims would go on to call the city Toletola and he took the city with very little resistance at all and in doing so Tariq ibn Ziyad had changed what originally was supposed to be just a little raid along the coast into a full-scale invasion by beating the main enemy army and then taking the capital city right here in the center of Iberia. He then sent word back to uh, his superior Musa ibn Nusayr who was in Qairawan which is in modern-day Tunisia to let him know of the resounding success that he'd had. mountain of Tariq, Jabal Tariq, Gibraltar. Uh, this mountain was actually known as one of the two pillars of Hercules. Um, in Greek mythology, this part of the world is where Hercules separated two mountains from each other, one in Europe, one in Africa, forever cleaving the two continents apart. The other mountain is across the Straits of Gibraltar, and you might just be able to see it in the background now. And at the moment, it's now known as Jabal Musa. And when Musa ibn Nusayr got word of what Tariq ibn Ziyad had accomplished, he rushed to his aid and met him in Toledo. And these two men, uh, Tariq ibn Ziyad, mountain named after him Jabal Tariq, Musa ibn Nusayr, mountain named after him Jabal Musa, these two men in a Herculean effort became the two pillars that would reunite Africa and Europe together again into the Umayyad Islamic Caliphate. If you are wondering how such a small force of Muslims led by Tariq ibn Ziyad were able to take over the Iberian Peninsula very easily well then there's a clue there Judios Jewish Street there was lots of Jews living in uh, the Iberian Peninsula at the time and they were a persecuted people by the Visigoths so when the Muslims came and the Muslims promised that they could uh, f they were free to worship and uh, they could go along uh, go about their daily lives and they, they're not allowed to be persecuted and you can get on with what you want the Jews were very very happy with this so they helped the Muslims in the invasion so the Muslims would um, arm them uh, once they'd taken the town uh, militarily and then they would move on to the next town and while they were conquering the next town the Jewish people would be looking after the, the previous town for them waiting for them to come back so um, they had some inside help um, the other question is what would the Muslims now go on to call this new land um, and prior to the Visigoths uh, ruling the land it was ruled by the Vandals and it's from their name that the Muslims got the name which they would call Iberia so from Vandals we get Andalus so they would call their, their new land Al-Andalus year 715 the Khalifa of the Muslims um, who was governing the whole Muslim world was called Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik and he died in Damascus and he was replaced by his brother who was called Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik and Suleiman couldn't really guarantee the loyalty of Tariq ibn Ziyad and Musa ibn Nusayr like his brother could Therefore, they were recalled from their conquests uh, in the Iberian Peninsula and they made their way back to Damascus, never to be heard of ever again. Um, 
and from then on they were replaced by uh, one of his one of the relatives of the Khalifa, the relatives of Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, and he was called Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi, and he would then lead the Muslims in a famous campaign uh, out of the Iberian Peninsula and deeper in to uh, Christendom, um, all the way into France. So Charles the Hammer Martel, King of the Franks, would prove to be the final nail in the coffin for Muslim expansion into Europe in the year 732 where he defeated Abdul Rahman al Ghafiqi and his forces 200 miles south of Paris. Um, a famous British historian years later or centuries later called Edward Gibbon when reading about this incident remarked if Charles the Hammer Martel had not defeated the Muslims at this battle then perhaps he would have carried on and the Quran would have been taught at Oxford. Probably an exaggeration but you get the point that he's trying to make. The Umayyad Caliphate would now rule vast lands from the Iberian Peninsula to the Indus River, from Tangiers to Tashkent in Central Asia, and from Cordoba to Karachi. This was one of the biggest empires that the world had ever seen. So the Muslims had conquered virtually all of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, there was only one remaining area left and that was in the far north of the peninsula and this area was called Astorius and Astorius was protected by a mountain range known as the Cantabrian Mountains and therefore it made it particularly difficult for the Muslims to conquer this area. In the year 722 or some people say the year 718 an army ventured up to try and take this final uh, bit of land um, but unfortunately they were beaten at the Battle of Covadonga um, and were repelled and there, therefore this area remained the only area which was under the control of the Visigothic Catholic people um, who had the whole I uh, Iberian Peninsula before the Muslims had come. Um, interestingly the Arab general at the time having lost the battle um, looked up the mountain and saw some of the Visigothic people celebrating their victory and he said what are a few men on a mountain and th that, that turned out to be famous last words because what that would lead to centuries down the line we'll be telling you about. After the Muslims had lost the Battle of Tours, just 200 kilometers south of uh, Paris, uh, they decided not to venture back into uh, the area which is now France ever again. And they stayed within the Iberian Peninsula and consolidated their gains there. Um, in terms of who undertook the conquest, the conquest was undertaken by Arabs and by Berbers. However, when it came to settling down and ruling the land, um, the, the Arabs and the Berbers were not uh, dealt with in the same way by the Umayyad ruling elite. So the Arabs uh, got better land at ruling positions, whereas the Berbers had to do all the hard work afterwards. And as a result, the Berbers weren't very happy with this because they'd both taken part uh, in the conquest. 
Um, this led to a revolt by the Berbers uh, in the Iberian Peninsula against Umayyad rule in the year 740. Um, in order to control this revolt, the Khalifa from uh, Damascus sent lots of uh, forces to, um, uh, to quell the Berbers. Uh, and what this resulted in was a huge number of Syrian Arabs or Arabs from the uh, surrounding uh, surroundings of Damascus being present in the Iber in the Iberian Peninsula, and this would have major uh, implications later on down the line. Also, um, what we see here is the beginning of a split in the. Um, Muslim society in Iberia i.e. between Berber and Arab and this split or this little crack would sometimes be very big and sometimes be very small but from then on it would always be present for the next roughly 15 years there would be a bit of turmoil uh, in, uh, in the Iberian Muslim society between the Arabs and between the Berbers um, this is after the rebellion has been uh, put down. Um, so Al-Andalus needed uniting. And the question was, who was the person who was going to unite them?